necessary. I'd like to welcome all of you to the second panel tonight. The first panel was about the situation in general and what happened in the past year and that the world has changed. And now we focus on this country, the Ukraine, with a headline towards a new country. And we'd like to understand what has changed in this past year. And over the course of this discussion, we will also discuss how our perception of the public in Germany and in Europe has changed, because there also is need for analysis. We have guests from the countries which are directly linked to Ukraine. Jacek Kuchacek from Poland comes from a country where the last freedom movement with more than one million people was successful. Solidarity in 1989, 79-80 was crushed with martial law, and we were able to find out that some of the discussions that we had in 79, 80, this is fascist, this is anti-Semites, suddenly cropped up again. Poland has made an experience, a tragic Ukrainian, Polish history that turned the Polish people into interpreters, so to say. Then to my left, Marie-Louise Beck. And Lilia Czewczowa already praised her and greeted her. But you know what, me, as a citizen, I'd like to do this also. Whenever I had the feeling now it's getting embarrassing. Now I need to feel ashamed. Then suddenly, Marie-Louise Beck stepped up and saved the situation. In fact, this is true. Marie, Marie, see, I, I was not paid to say this, but I guess I should say it. This was true during the Bosnian War. Also during the Kafkaesque processes against Mikhail Khodorkovsky and in numerous other situations that were brought up earlier on also Navalny, this was the case too. And I know that it is not that easy to defend the positions within the Green Party that you stood up for in the past months and also in the context with Ukraine, Marie-Louise Beck is one of the few who at least travels there to get a first-hand impression in full, and also Rebecca Harms, of course, I mean, uh, others also. And unfortunately, she's not in the panel, otherwise I would tell her personally that I love this also. In this quickly paced world where we have a lot of accusations when it comes to politicians, this is overlooked. And this is why I stated quite clearly tonight. And then we have Evgeny Gondmacher here tonight from Russia. One of the faces of the political approach that you never ever associate with Russia, a social, political thinker who deals with the past, but also with modernization. He has great hope for the modernization partnership and modernization period under the Medvedev presidency. And I think was also rather disillusioned in September 2011 when Putin said, oh, by the way, the king is coming back when this uh, rotation continued and Putin took over again. 
I am with Osteuropa, and one of the mottos is that we don't speak about the others, but with the others. And last but not least, we also want to talk with Svitlana Salivchuk. She represents at least three different positions. She is a journalist, she is an NGO activist. She is one of the few who, a bit more than a year ago, Mustaya Maniemf said, I go to Maidan who joins in. She supported, she mobilized, she was there herself. And thanks to this impressive mobilization, that increased to amount to millions of people, suddenly turned her into a politically active person. And this is what we experienced on the Maidan, i.e. that people take action themselves. And since October, via the list of the blog Petro Poroshenko, she is now a member of the Hofner Rada. Of course, the first question is for Svetlana. It is very difficult to talk about societies and to use organic terms. But we tried to do this in the first panel. And it was said, well, well, the regions in the East, Donetsk and Luhansk, are like wounds that poison the whole organ, the whole body. Let's do a medical anamnesis. Let's do an examination of the patient called Ukraine. Where, where was Ukraine a year ago? Where is the Ukraine today? You named three of my capacities, but you didn't mention the fourth one. And who haven't figured out yet, I'm a representative of Ukrainian junta. Uh, this is how we look like. <laughs> It's the fifth one, but we don't uh, we t uh, try to, to mention it. Well, um, to be honest, I regret that I'm here. I regret that we conduct this conference, because I would like we wouldn't have. I would like we have some other topics, and uh, we would be somewhere else. But unfortunately, we are at this spot, and this time, not only we Ukrainians, but all together with Europeans and the whole world who is thinking, so what's going to be next? And I'm going to tell you that actually Soviet gravity, which is embodied into the Russian ambition to rebuild its empire, which is embodied into the Russian ambition to create Eurasian Union, keeps on to be the strongest power in the region that keeps on redrawing the boundaries on the map. And uh, yes, there's Transnistria and uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia and now Crimea and Donbass are the victims of this gravity, of this most powerful force in the region. And it is an open question of how much many, how more many countries will be deorbited de by Moscow. And in my opinion, I have to say that um, I think it much will depend on whether West is ready to reconsider its approach towards neighboring Russian neighboring countries as to the sphere of its legitimate interest. There's no justification to justify Putin's fear of NATO and EU system on its border by blocking an independent country's choice to choose its friend, especially, even and especially if it is European Union and NATO. Well, in fact, Ukraine has to win two wars. And one is in the East, one is a war with Russia, but another one is um, an internal fight against corruption, against rotten institutions, post-Soviet old system. And I think it's uh, the most important victory that has to take place in people's mind, in people's habit, in people's culture. Both fights actually are an attempt to break up with Soviet past. 
to overcome its gravity. The walls had fallen, but who said they can't be erected again? There is an essential interdependency between these two battles, and the war in Donbass uh, is a very difficult. With war in Donbass, it's very difficult to launch the reforms. But at the same time, without the reforms, it's just impossible to win the war in Donbass. Because in the end, this reunion of our territories, in a longer term perspective, will be based on just people's wish to live better life. And it's up to current president and government and parliament to create, to ensure this better life. Conditions to implement reforms in Ukraine become increasingly worse and uh, especially taking into account economic crisis and humanitarian situation. Uh, I think we, when we use these uh, words, hybrid war, we probably overestimate the place and the weight of, uh, of uh, hybrid in these two words and underestimate the word a war. Because I would like Thank you. I would like to, to tell you that as a result of illegal annexation of Crimea, Ukraine lost its territory that equal, equals to half of Estonia. And uh, Crimean Tatars, and I'm talking about 250,000 of people, they lost their motherland again. And being a Tatar, a Crimean Tatar, is already a danger itself. These people, this ethnic uh, minority, lives in a constant pressure, repressions of all kinds, religious, economic, political, social. Do we pay enough attention to this problem in the region? Now, I would also like to mention the two regions of Ukraine, Lugansk and Donetsk Oblast, equals to half of the territory of uh, Lower Saxony, for example. Two million people that remain there very often don't have just simply gas, electricity, water, access to any kind of money. It's not a, just a small conflict, it's some luxurious, I don't know, fight somewhere, but it's a real conditions of the war. And we have to take into our mind. Let me also mention that we have one million people that already in, in internally displaced people. Can you imagine when one million people lost their houses, their transport, their jobs, their business, their, they left their kindergarten, schools and everything else. And now they live in Ukraine and uh, the current government, current parliament has to take care about those people. Well, nevertheless, despite this scale and magnitude of the humanitarian disaster, Ukraine needs to move forward. And hybrid war cannot be finished with the hybrid peace, but even more, this economic disaster cannot be finished with the hybrid reforms. That's why it changes to be drastic, radical, fast and comprehensive. Well, uh, recently, IMF assessed Ukrainians' total budget deficit at 10, more than 10% of GDP. And the public de debt is skyrocketing, and we had approximately 41% of GDP in the end of 2013. But uh, these days, it's uh, approximately more than 60% of GDP. Ukraine has entered, as you know, a depreciation inflation cycle, and uh, at the exchange rate falls, more banks are collapsing. I would like to give you just a small example. As a member of the parliament, it's usually impressed people. As a member of the parliament, I earn 150 euro a month, not a thousand, 160 euro a month. And believe me, much more people in Ukraine, millions of people, dozens of millions of people live even worse life and have even less resources to survive themselves and to support their families. Uh, there is a small, there is a small passage that uh, in my speech that has certain optimism, although it's only two sentences. Uh, last week we had some new good news from IMF uh, that they promised to give us 40 billion of dollars given for four years in the frame of, of so-called extended fund facility, together with very strict demands for obligatory painful reforms. 
package, package. And I believe that it has certain potential to become uh, a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. I would like to underline that international role in Ukrainian cri crisis is crucial, but not only when it comes to finance. I mean, money doesn't have to be, become a ransom for the lack of the real leadership. Ukrainian fight against Russia aggression is fact is a battle against, or rather, yes, for European values. And the solution of the conflict, together with economic success in Ukraine, will be about the development of the whole region, will be about the success of the future European idea. And ultimately, it is about also the future of uh, Russia. I have to say that to overcome Soviet gravity is not impossible. And more than I wish Ukraine to become a real European democracy, I wish even more for Russia to become a real democracy. Because in that case, we'll, have, we'll be able to build this peace uh, in our region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana Solitschuk. Jacek. 1989. Is this, in fact, the starting position? Was the economic power of the Ukraine at that time stronger than the one of Poland? In 1989, no one imagined in Poland that this reform package would because of this economic disastrous situation be possible. And the people in Poland were confronted with the situation that it, those who led the, the movement of freedom, i.e. the shipyard workers, were actually the first one who were dismissed. From your Polish perspective, can you tell us more about how you perceive the situation in Ukraine, also with you and against the backdrop of your successful Polish reforms? Do we have a hopeless situation in Ukraine, which is not serious? Thank you, thank you for this question, <coughs> and thank you for inviting me to this great discussion. Uh, there are so many parallels that you can uh, draw between Poland, or at least we tend to draw back in, in Poland between uh, Poland and Ukraine on so many historical planes that I, I think uh, it would take me quite a while to, to talk about them all. Uh, Timoth Timothy Snyder already mentioned some of the historical uh, uh, memories and parallels, and uh, obviously when we speak some of the Kremlin rhetoric against the Ukrainian state. We think about uh, Poland between wars and how it was its statehood was questioned. So from even from this point of view, we, we feel a certain solidarity with Ukrainians against this this uh, uh, propagandistic attacks. Uh, more more uh, directly to your questions, uh, Polish solidarity movement. Uh, Failure at first under, after the martial law was imposed, and then uh, less than 10 years later, uh, a successful uh, movement which first liberated Poland from communist uh, dominance and then uh, helped the transformation of the entire region. Uh, I think it's a, uh, also a good, good way of thinking about uh, Maidan, and many people in Poland were actually so impressed with Maidan and its achievement, its peaceful revolution uh, in the name of Europe and European values. And we, we, we naturally think, tend to think that, that uh, Poles, Polish people and Polish government should support Ukrainian reform movements uh, because of the similarities in our histories, but also because for pragmatic reasons. And we have always thought that the new post-1989 order in Europe is, is only secure when there is a strong independent Ukraine which observes uh, European standards, European rules. So in a way, this is on both values and interests. Poland uh, wants Ukrainian uh, reforms uh, to succeed. Uh, 
Also, the, the parallel with, with uh, Polish reforms and Ukrainian reforms, I have to say, when I look at, at uh, we, ha we had 25 years of transition in Poland with lots of discussions about what went right, what went wrong, a lot of uh, soul searching, what we could have done earlier about the lessons of this transition. But I think the overall uh, uh, the direction of this debate was that, that Poland was successful and that Polish transformation and especially its European integration contributed to uh, to uh, stability in Europe. And if you think about how Europe would look today without Central Europeans being the members of the EU, being part of this Eastern gray zone, I think that we, we would all agree that, that the whole Europe would be much worse off if there was not this, uh, uh, in a way, leap of faith that, that Poland and other Central Europeans can, uh, can become uh, full members of European community, of transatlantic community. And I think that, that the most general lesson fro from the Polish experience is that we need to have similar faith in the ability of Ukrainians to conduct reforms, to use the energies of the Maidan in order to, for Ukraine to become, uh, well, let's say it, maybe a future member of the European Union, even though now Europe doesn't have uh, this, this kind of open-mindedness and generosity that it demonstrated towards Poland. Even I, I just remind you one thing, that uh, the visa requirement for Poles was abolished in 1990, and to some European countries in 91. We, we didn't have to wait for so many years, and Ukrainians are still waiting for this uh, tangible proof that uh, Europe, the EU, is, is open to, to, to and is serious about integrating Ukraine uh, within, within European, European structures. So one thing is, uh, I, I think that if you look about Polish experience and all the ups and downs on, of our both domestic reforms and also of our integration with the EU, you first of all realize that it was worth it. It was a good investment for Poland, but also for Europe. But also you realize how difficult this reformatory process was. We also had a big problem with corruption for many, many years. Uh, had lots of different problems. But what is also important to remember that Ukrainians are doing this reformatory process in much more difficult conditions, not only because Europe is itself in crisis and less generous, but also because there is a real war going on there. And it's the country is under attack from, uh, from Russia. That's, that's, I think that's the most important thing to remember. And that's where parallel ends. And I think that we in addition to helping the reformatory package, we need to help Ukraine defend itself. And this is, I think, the, my last message. I think it's both short-term and long-term challenge for the EU and the Western the transatlantic community to help Ukraine defend its sovereignty, its uh, integrity, uh, in view of this real war. Because I, I agree, the metaphor of two wars is tempting, but it's really that there is one real war when people are shooting at each other, people are dying, civilians are dying. And I think that, that uh, in a way, we should understand the difficulties of the process and show good faith and patience towards Ukrainians who try to defend their country and reform it at the same time. So that's my message here. Schönen Dank. Yeah, thank you very much. Marie, same question actually goes to you, because it also affects the German perspective. Despite all problems that this metaphor of two wars has, because the real war in the east of Ukraine is sort of played down by using this metaphor, something which we definitely do not want to do, we still see the question of how can we solve this dilemma of simultaneousness in a situation where a war has been imposed, imposed on Ukraine. Ralf Fuchs, in his introductory remarks, mentioned four of five different buzzwords that Svetlana also touched upon. Dramatic inflation, he said, 
collapse of the economy, more aggravating social crisis, Svetlana mentioned homeless people and internally displaced people, nationalist mobilization against a reform policy of the government of Poroshenko. The air is becoming thin, is what Ralf Fuchs said for liberal forces. Where do we start? Well, there's definitely no beginning or end, but you can mention certain points that happen simultaneously and that have to be changed simultaneously. First of all, I would like to shed light on us. That is not only on Germany, although Germany is an important player, but also on Europe as a whole and the European Union in a narrow sense, because whenever it is said in Ukraine, we are fighting for your freedom, I have the impression that this is falling into a black hole because people do not understand that statement. They say, what are they talking about? They have a problem in eastern Ukraine. What does that have to do with us? And allow me to say the following. This year, with this existential conflict in Ukraine, in, at the same time showed us in Germany and the European Union what problem we have. It was sort of a mirror that forces us to look into totally new faces, faces that we actually do not really like to look at. And I would like to list some of those faces. And Timothy Snyder is actually the one who, with his Bloodlands book, and he wrote that book before the war in and about Ukraine broke out. So his Bloodlands book highlights and illustrates many of those faces. Having said that, let me start with Germany. The fact that it has been so easy in Germany and that there have been so many that were ready so quickly, and I think it is exactly our environment, the left, liberal, alternative, green environment, that is, to denounce this Maidan as undermined by fascist forces, anti-Semitic features, to be ready to take up the myth that the Americans are behind this whole endeavor. All of that has shown that we, especially we here in Germany, who like to claim that there is no other country intensively coping with its own history as we have done, and we sometimes say we have come to terms with our history, so that we have to press the reset button, sort of, and take a look at our relationship to Ukraine. And what do we see when doing that? We somehow understood that there was a crime committed by German Nazis by attacking Poland. And the second side sort of got lost, i.e. that this attack was based on an agreement with the second totalitarian regime. I think that a well-educated student at a secondary school might know September 1st, but I'm sure that he might not know September 17th. And even if we asked German MPs what happened on September 17th, I don't know whether they really know about this event. The fact that indeed there is a historic awareness of German guilt and thus there is responsibility for the crimes committed in the Soviet Union. 
and obviously there is a mental deficit when it comes to comparing it today with historical responsibility vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Our media, our political elites still believe, and they don't do this because they are evil, and I often hear that. I hear something like, do you really want, if you are so critical to Russia, and I'm critical to Putin, not to Russia, so if you're so t critical to the Kremlin, then please think of the 27 million Russians that died or were killed. And they do this subconsciously. They don't know that the war against the Soviet Union and against the Red Army took place at the time on the grounds of today's Baltic states, of today's Belarus, of today's Ukraine, and not because not only Shoah, but also the many crimes against the Ukrainian population that were non-Jews. And yes, of course, there was collaboration, but are we the first ones to point to collaboration? Or is there something coming up like when it comes to the Israel-related debate? Stop the thief. The Israelis aren't better either. Look what they are doing with the Palestinians. An Israeli analyst called this rejecting the guilt of anti-Semitism. Sometimes I have the impression that the coolness against Ukraine and this willingness to accept that they are guilty themselves. You don't know what role the oligarchs are playing. They shouldn't do a fuss about it. They could remain neutral. Why don't they accept a role between Moscow and Berlin? And also, as I said, those fascists over there. So these statements show us that there is a projective reaction of defense. And we didn't look at what Timothy Snyder is teaching. The Deutsche Wehrmacht, our fathers, the SS in Ukraine, including the facet of collaboration. Bandera should not be swept under the carpet. So I think we have to take a look at all these things, because you mentioned Bosnia earlier. I'm looking for an answer to the question why there is this coolness in Germany. Why are the Germans so cold? That was different with Bosnia. With Bosnia, we managed to create a situation where people did not talk about a Serbian aggression in the discourse. No, there was this widespread statement saying, if they are killing each other down there, then we can't change it, unfortunately. So this Russian propaganda, which is really shocking, is unique. I mean, there was also propaganda regarding Bosnia, but people here in Germany were more ready to accept refugees. They were more acceptable. They loaded trucks and sent them down there to help people. Things were happening everywhere. But when it comes to Ukraine, there's a lot of coldness. One million of refugees, again, right in the middle of Europe. Imagine what this means, right in the middle of Europe. And we pretend as if it is even farther away than areas that are really far away. And this really occupies me. We have to discuss our approach. We have to discuss the approach of the left. I mean, we also provided certain buzzwords. And we have to discuss that Pegida that we condemn a lot are holding Russian flags, also George's flags. I think, I think there's a political mix and chaos. 
I have talked a lot, but this is something which is really close to my heart. Then, as a concentric circle, we have the European Union with all its doubts as to who wants to do what to whom. Do the southern Europeans want to go more to Eastern Europe? The neighborhood policy was ex developed exactly for that, to keep them away, sort of. Yes, come closer, but don't come too close. So there was no such thing as a clear EU perspective. And then the Italians with Berlusconi, and they had a good relationship with Putin, and these are the puppets, so to speak. I think that the German Chancellor and I would really like to say that here, is trying to hold Europe together. And I think she's doing a good job. Of course, she has to accept certain compromises where we would have said that everything should have been a little tougher or she should have been a little tougher. But not to give in and let the EU collapse. I think this is a great endeavor and achievement. So I might be able to come back later to answer your question more comprehensively. But the unity of Europe to make Ukraine our business and to understand that we are fighting for you is not just an empty sentence. I think this is something which we need as a foundation. I mean, we all agree that this will take years. This will take years, but we need a lot of stamina for that, and this would be a good foundation. The analysis. So the analysis is definitely true when it comes to the first phase of the Ukraine. It also holds true when it comes to the annexation of Crimea. And I guess it becomes now a bit more fragile after the shooting down of the Malaysian aircraft. I mean, this really changed public opinion here in Germany. There's now more support for Ukraine. And also in the context of the ceasefire mission of Ms. Merkel, it became quite obvious and also how the media reported on this. But this is just a footnote. Evgeny Gondmacher, when it comes to the question why Putin has so many people who are loyal, and when it comes to the annexation decision and the decision to invade, subverse, infiltrate eastern Ukraine, Usually, there are four interpretations to these questions in Germany. First, Russia's elite fears a well-functioning democracy and a rule of law and a smoothly running state called Ukraine. Putin's leadership wants a Russian edition of Maidan to be avoided. Third, the reintegration of the Soviet era should be pushed towards a Eurasian Union. And fourth, the Western orientation of Ukraine towards EU and NATO should be avoided. Now, Svetlana Salivchuk just said, well, the success of this war on two fronts, in the East and in the internal structure of the country, fighting all structures, is also a struggle when it comes to the future of Russia. Where do you see yourself? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Böll Foundation for this exciting conference and that you do this commemorating Boris Nevchuk is really wonderful. We cooperated for more than 20 years and only in December last year, we organized a conference together called the European Election. 
Let me give you an answer regarding the question of Putin. But first of all, the delusion. I mean, you kind of hurt my feelings, my feelings and Russia's feeling. I think it's easy to hurt my feelings, even though it might be difficult when it comes to hurting Russian feelings. Russia undergoes convulsions, and we do this in Gorbachev. At the time, there were attempts to carry out reforms. We know of this. Then there were, again, attempt to carry out reforms with Yeltsin. Very often the current situation is explained with the fact that these reforms have never been completed, comparable to Kiev. When Putin became president and asked Mr. Graf to hammer out a program, it wasn't a bad idea, but it didn't work well. Then Medvedev, well, But the question is then, what is the difference between optimism and pessimism? Pessimism means that you leave the country. It was quite easy to me. In many different countries, I will find a job, but I will not emigrate. I will not leave the country. The radio of Putin is now 85%, but 15% are still missing. 15% don't support Putin. And in our committee, we work with these 15 people, which is quite a lot, and Svetlana will prove this. In Ukraine, this will probably be 50% of the people who participated and supported the Maidan movement. So in Russia, there is an elite which is uh, small, but nevertheless, it shouldn't be ignored. And illusion, yeah, of course, I'm also delusioned. And uh, we heard very often Sovchok, where he talked about his experience and his methods and what he is doing. And maybe I can say the following. As long as there is a minor chance, we will go for it. Lilia Mischova, for instance, is very skeptical of the opinion that there are no longer options. But then I ask, well, but what do we see for Russia? Revolutions? war, this will be a great problem for Europe when unexpected things happen in Russia. I'm not a supporter of Putin, and I don't call to support him because in the era after Putin, it will be ever worse. So this is not what I say. But I think it is an important fact. Europe also has to think about Russia, not as during the 1990s or 2000. This is something we've understood. And I don't want to come up with my own claims and criticize everything we saw in the past. But I think there need to be a turnaround, an ideological turnaround, also against the backdrop of recent events in Ukraine. Putin has not the idea to come up with a new Ukraine. No, even Mr. Sababayev, Lukashenko, such personalities of the post-Soviet type, I mean, these guys are scared when you attack their sovereignty. They are scared. I mean, of course, we do have economic cooperation. And we also had a presentation where we said that this integration is only negative. This Eurasian Union is only to the detriment. And others benefit. So what was the problem of Ukraine? Putin wanted to integrate Ukraine into this area. Ukraine is a large country with huge potential. And we remember with President Yanukovych that the Russian capital flew to Ukraine. Mr. Burazov, Russian ambassador to Ukraine, was sent there even before Maidan, before all the events. But the plan didn't work out. What was the plan? This economic integration that was supposed to happen to have a level playing field with Europe, with Kyrgyzstan, with Armenia, with Belarus, and all the others, all them small countries, but nevertheless, would add up to a cloud that allowed Russia to have a whole different kind of negotiations with Europe on gas, on oil, on everything. See, I analyzed all this. I also followed TV programs live. I understand Ukrainian, Polish, my mom comes from Poland, 
And uh, I also have a shared history with Ukraine. My grandfather, he has my name. He died in Vinitsa and uh, suffered there greatly. My grandmother lived in Ukraine during the Holocaust and also Poland. I have a lot of relatives who lived in Poland and who got killed there. So I can really share the emotions of the people in Ukraine. Maybe I'm a rare representative of Russia who, of course, with the limited options, is interested how reforms must look like and how they can be implemented. Because I have a personal interest and we see this post-Soviet situation, post-Soviet republics such as Moldova. We also see the experience of the formerly central Soviet republics. Georgia achieved a certain breakthrough with Saakashvili. All the others, and I'll leave aside the Baltic states, but I mean, there was a great European idea. They wanted to come back to Europe and they implemented this idea. But all the others, all the other post-Soviet republics actually try to get rid of this Soviet mentality. And what does it mean? Well, the mentality means that the state solves all the problems and steps in all the time, which is impossible. 70 years of Soviet power. I mean, in the Ukraine, it was only since 44. It was a bit less than 70 years. But this is actually a problem. It is a problem because the people cannot pull forces. I mean, of course, there are laws in Russia that would allow people to do so. But now there is a worsening of the situation. The quality of laws is very bad. I therefore think that Russia has now the opportunity and the chance, and maybe the colleagues here in the room will now say that uh, we have now a battle between the fridge and the TV set in Russia, TV, massive propaganda, where it's only about fascists and the fridge, I mean, the fridge remains empty because the Russian economy, and this is actually something you can really believe me, the Russian economy has seen a great decline. Putin, who became president in 2000, at the time, there was not such a decline. However, in a year or two from now, we will see this. There will be self-organization plans for people to help themselves. And civil society will, with this idea of self-protection, emerge because people will understand that they have to rescue themselves because of all the social problems getting worse and worse. There will not be extraordinary situations. And we also know in Russia that from one day to the other, different things can happen. But I believe that our civil society in a year or two will be strong enough to exert reasonable pressure on institutions simply because people will no longer have food in the fridge. And our work to educate, to educate people in political terms has the aim that those people who stand out and come up with claims can also stand for a certain quality. So far, civil society is not yet professional. We work on this professionalization, and we need a larger window of time to achieve this. I mean, maybe as of tomorrow, something like this can emerge in Russia. But based on the tendencies we see right now, I guess we need some more time. But then something will happen. And as we heard, Russia has no other solution than turning towards democracy. But it remains to be seen what the price for this will be. Svetlana, in the first panel and also now, we see that it will be primarily about the functioning of the state, that it is be reestablished. Courts need to function. Administration needs to function. The welfare state should work. All this defines a strong state. When it comes to your daily work, what does this mean? Because in contrast to Poland, you have the problem in Ukraine that you actually have the same people who are now public prosecutors 
as during Maidan and before. It is the same people in local authorities, in the ministries, who are now responsible to carry out energy reforms, tax reforms, etc., etc. And then the problem of corruption still going on. You as a politician, how do you want to tackle this problem? Uh, I pull the, the framework uh, in Ukraine that even everything is not enough now. But, uh, and I have to say that lived through Orange Revolution in 2004 and after Euromaidan, we clearly realized that it's not just enough to change the faces in the government. It's not enough to elect the new president. It's even not enough to vote for the new, very good European legislation. It's up to the institutions. It's up to the whole generation of bureaucrats who will be able, who will be skilled enough, knowledgeable enough to realize those new policies that we are voting for. And I have to say that in recent year, we adopted a lot of new legislation that are pretty good and uh, uh, evaluated by the European Union as best legislation in European Union. And I'm talking about anti-corruption policies. We created anti-corruption bureau. We, I'm talking about broadcasting system, public broadcasting system in media sphere, access to public information. We voted a particularly successful uh, law. Then recently we voted for a judicial reform. But it's, once again, it's up to 3,050 hundred bureaucrats that are stayed the same on all those levels. And it's up to changing their habits uh, of dealing with this on a daily basis. So my point that it will take us not months and even not years, to be honest, but the whole generation in order to change, to, to, to uh, launch, to, to feel these tangible results from the reforms. But uh, at the same time, I have to say that uh, I think that many of the speakers have mentioned that, that at the moment Ukraine um, is not ready to fulfill it alone. We don't have enough of not just capacities, but resources. And many speakers have mentioned about the, need, the help that we need. And I would like, uh, would like to repeat it. It's about military arm, it's about weapon in order to defend us in the East. Because we lost the Baltsova after this Minsk II agreement just because we didn't have enough of arms, enough military resources. Then we need financial support. And let me remind you that IMF indeed, they gave us 40 billion of dollars but in comparison to Greece, which is a smaller, which enjoyed much less level of crisis and that didn't have a war in its territory, was given 240 billion of dollars. You, you should remember it. Then I want to mention that we need some help from European experts, from European Commission, in terms of building our institutional capacities in all of the institutions, in the ministries, in other uh, bodies, just to bring people, to bring experts who would teach us, who, would, uh, who will teach us to realize those policies. Uh, also, with the liberalization regime. Yes, thank you, Jacek. I really appreciate that you mentioned it. Uh, and we hope that at the Riga summit in May, finally, visa for Ukrainians will be abolished. Because at the moment, only 12% of Ukrainians have ever traveled abroad. Can you imagine? Only 12%. And still those people, by millions at Euromaidan, were fighting for European idea. I don't remember how many other people with the flags of European Union died for, for European ideas. I don't know many other countries in the European Union. These are the help and the scale of help that we need. So uh, my point would be alone we won't, we won't succeed. And that's why the role of European Union and the United States, once again, is crucial. Jacek, ganz... Jacek. A very concrete question to you from the perspective of a person who works in an institute for public administration. Can Poland, when it comes to capacity building, support the other or convince the other Europeans of this being the key to success during the reform period in Poland? And where should Europeans focus on when it comes to capacity building? What should they focus on? I, 
think that the list of needs, as, as uh, uh, was mentioned here, is, is sorry. The, the list of needs of Ukraine is, is very long, and I think that the first challenge is actually to stabilize the economy. And uh, yes, we need to think about long term. Uh, we need to be patient, but at the same time, there are two very urgent needs. One is to stabilize the economy and give the government the breathing space it needs to implement more ambitious package of reforms. And second need is uh, the ability to defend itself. There is this discussion whether providing arms is a solution or not. For me, if Ukrainian government says that they need weapons to defend themselves, I think that they know what they are saying and that they're not saying it for nothing. So I would make a very strong case for this. As regards the institutional reform, uh, Experts uh, are needed. I think that uh, especially Poland can offer genuine uh, experience of decentralization reform, not the phony calls for federalization that are coming from Russia, but the real transfer of power to local communities, which was one of the most successful parts of Polish transformations. But we have to be aware, again, that in Poland, after 25 years of transition, we still uh, worried about uh, the quality of our judiciary system. Uh, so let's let's understand. We we won't deal with this problem all at once and all the problems. Uh, I think we need to adopt a long-term perspective and uh, monitor the reforms to see that progress is being done. Uh, but uh, as, I, as I'm saying, I think that the, the situation is so urgent and so desperate that we need to focus now on, uh, on these uh, uh, short-term remedies which are, which are sorely missing. And I, I completely agree uh, that this proportion between the uh, assistance that went to Greece and what Europe, European Union is willing to offer Ukraine is is uh, mind-boggling. I, I think that's uh, there's something wrong with with Europe today. If if we we cannot support Ukraine at this moment of need uh, with adequate finances, not to mention other other uh, resources. Marie Louise, same question. Same question to you, Marie Louise. Well, first of all, there will be a race against the danger that a state simply becomes bankrupt. Having said that, the question of short-term quick funds and money is at stake and important. And if you want to be honest, you have to say that, of course, not simultaneously with the incredible speed there will be a tangible, solid system of institutions. And of course, part of the money will disappear eventually. But I think we have to accept that. And this is why I talked in length about the question of what are we willing to do? Do we really understand what is happening and what this is all about? It's not about imperialistic Europeans buying another piece of land because, like the Russian Empire, we have the evil Americans in our backs and they have also this imperialist thinking and now we also buy Ukraine. No. So we need to accept that it comes down to a next step after Yalta. It comes down to another piece of European unification. And we need to make sure that Putin cannot just sit back and keep the war going a little bit while the economy will do its own, i.e. Mr. Poroshenko will have to announce we are bankrupt no salaries anymore in and for the public service, no gas, no warm feet anymore. So we do not need a lot of imagination to sketch this scenario. This would be my darn three. Then you would have to 
get new special forces, you put them in black uniforms, send them to the Maidan, and government Yanushenko, sorry, Poroshenko and Yatsenyuk will be ousted and the Kremlin will make sure that there is order and structure again according to Putin's ideas. So, in a nutshell, we need to help this country financially in the short term. Secondly, this is a Hercules task. We can not only de depend upon public investments. Poland, despite all the problems that you had, did quite a good job. You have sort of a middle class in Poland nowadays, and this is also a lesson that needs to be learned. And Mr. Gondmacher knows this best because it is not uh, about erecting a state economy which is funded by the capitalist West. No, you have to pay the price of setting up a middle class. Small and medium-sized enterprises have to be built. And this is very difficult and complex because functioning companies at the moment have a problem. They were originally supplied by Crimea. Now they have to stop their production, etc. So the opening of the European market is one of those kickoff incentives. And thirdly, visa liberalization to make sure that people will be patient enough and not tell Svetlana in two years, hey, you didn't perform. By the way, this also this should also apply to Russia so that Russians understand that we do not want to wage war against Russia, that we do not have anything against the Russians, but that we have a dispute with the Kremlin. And this is a big difference. And last point. I wish more empathy. So we also have to travel there. City partnerships, projects have to be implemented. The same things that we did with Bosnia. We have to prove and show that Ukraine is a European country, that we see it as a European country and that it is a country that we want. I think these are just a few of the suggestions that I would like to make. Okay, Svetlana, I would like to come back to you again. If Maidan changed something, then it changed exactly what Yevgeny Gondmacher called overcoming paternalism, overcoming the Soviet style, i.e. to expect everything from the state. Because, in fact, people took to the streets and, in addition to this big statement, loans from the West, whether it is 40 or 70 billion, doesn't matter right now. So people say we need loans that are based on conditionalities. Yet there is a very banal question. There has already been an uprising in Ukraine in 2004, and there was a lot of stamina and perseverance at the time. And of course, money will disappear as a consequence of corruption. But the big difference of Maidan a year ago was that hundreds of thousands of people suddenly empowered themselves. So in this Ukrainian grassroots movement, is it long term? So how long is it going to exist? Do they care about or still care about the fight against corruption? When it comes to the media and the press, do they control and monitor what is happening? How strong is a highly traumatized population as a consequence of the war, as a consequence of refugees, as a consequence of ongoing violence transfer from the East back to the families? So is such a population actually able to exercise civil society control. Thank you for this question. Uh, yes, you're right. In 2004, we lived already through a revolution. It was the Orange Revolution. But the difference between 2014 and 2004 was the fact that that time we were fighting 
uh, we were standing for a new president. This time, for a new face, basically. This time, we were standing not for new faces in the politics, but for the new rules in the politics. And it was a defining, a key criteria, a key characteristics of that Euromaidan. It was a very powerful injection in 2004 for people who understood that they can actually choose. Unfortunately, that Orange government didn't deliver and didn't succeed with the uh, dramatic, uh, dramatic reforms. But in 2014, uh, we have experienced censorship. We made the choice in favor of freedom of speech. Having experienced political persecution for those last 10 years, we chose political, political competition. And uh, I think um, the main thing that we realized that we have a different identity. We made our choice. And it's not just the West or the East, but this identity is defined by the core values. It's freedom of speech, it's freedom of expression, it's freedom of assemblies. And I think it's the main thing that now, as a new generation of Ukraine, they have this identity. we chosen to be Europeans. This is the most sustainable thing in Ukraine, I would like to say. Yes, with reforms, it's a question to what extent and how fast they will be successful. But with identity, we're a European nation. We are European generation. And uh, this is the main, the, the bottom line, the, the ground with what we start our move, movement uh, to, the, to the West. You know, the name of the revolution was the revolution of dignity. And I think it's a very right, right word for that. I would like to mention one more thing. I also knew Boris Nemtsov. And last time I met him, he told me one very nice thing. He said, I remembered it very well. He said, you know what is the difference between political system in Ukraine and in Russia? It's a, that you have a choice. Now we are paying very high price for our knowing, for, for, our, for our choice, for our conscious choice. He also paid with his life trying to bring the choice to, to Russia as one of potential, probably, uh, next leaders, as one of the leaders of opposition. So um, I would like to just undermine that, underline that um, our choice was conscious. And that's what gives us the hope that it is sustainable. Evgeny Gondmacher. From a Russian analytical perspective, I would like to know from you how you assess the current equation made by the Putin government. What has Russia won? What has Russia lost? Okay, so again, what about the Russian elite today? How does the Russian elite assess this one last year? Let me give you an example of how you sh could think about it and then you say yes or no, just to make sure that we understand what you're talking about. Okay, you could say that the last year has been a disaster for Putin's regime. What have they won? Crimea, which needs to be subsidized. Eastern Ukraine with fighters that they can no longer control at the expense of sanctions that are economically feasible or viable and that triggered a huge crisis, a gigantic isolation in Europe and also against or vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And there is a high probability that, unlike the Caucasian War in 2008, this is not a temporary period or problem, but this is a long-term serious, serious structural crisis 
which might remind us of a similar historical phase, i.e. the stagnation period under Brezhnev. The invasion of Afghanistan at the time seemed to be a very successful operation in the beginning, but then it turned out to be the first nail of the coffin of the Soviet Union. So what calculus do people from Putin's environment have and take? What calculus do you have and use as an economist and independent analyst? Well, first of all, first of all, we need to discuss what do you mean by direct environment of Putin. I mean, see, even our political experts they discuss who influences the decision making. I myself, I can say the following: the past year was a negative one for Russia. And many people understand this. I mentioned these 15% earlier on. And these 15% is not just people in the regions that have a democratic tradition dating back to the 1990s. No, it also has to do with the economy. See, and the big corporations, they don't like the current situation at all because the sanctions that were imposed, and, and of course, some people say that they don't have an effect. But I mean, when you think of these sanctions, then you see that Russia is a country, in contrast to Iran, where these sanctions show an impact. And why do I talk about the economy? I mean, the small size companies, they suffer greatly. They want to close their doors and companies. And when you read the newspapers, you see that they close their companies because it's no longer worth it to produce something, to offer a service. Economic growth declines. Demand is dwindling. Very classic, as in Ukraine. The real incomes are decreasing. And of course, people first need to have money for food before they invest the money into something else, things they might buy. So I talked about the economy. And of course, these people don't say this publicly because this is, in fact, rather dangerous. Uh, we have examples for this risk and danger. But I know of voices from the world of the economy where people wish for reforms and changes. And our agenda is similar to the one of Ukraine. As Svetlana said, the administration needs to be reformed. Structural reforms comes next. We need a normal standardized justice system. I mean, everything that Svetlana says also holds true for our country. And we try to work on these reforms. When it comes to the political elite, I think we don't even have one. I mean, there are a few people, such as uh, Boris Nemtsov or from the Amazamas Partei, uh, the official political parties that are active are not real parties, but they are simply voting machines. And well, what is really on the heads and minds of the people? I mean, I don't know. Probably they will say that they are not in a good situation, but nevertheless, they do support the system. Our banking system is alarmed because the sectoral sanctions make now impossible foreign currencies, and this could lead to the closure of numerous banks. We already have a weak banking system. This is a crisis that will have grave social implications. 85%, I mean, early on I was talking about the 15%, but now I come back to the 85% of people who support uh, Putin can dwindle quickly. I mean, see, this is uh, 50, 40, 
percent who are in favor of maybe a new president or prime minister or also in favor of a position. I mean, 85 percent is not something that you can compare with Merkel's and Obama's popularity ratings. So people are dissatisfied, but what this will lead to is something we cannot forecast. I mean, there are people from Putin's direct environment who don't see the danger. But I mean, see, in our system, we have decisions taken by one guy. Now, everybody, you have the opportunity to ask questions. Please don't give call presentations. But now you can get involved, and I hope that we have once again microphones. So please, first, the gentleman in the third row. For Crimea SOS organization. I have to, I want to return us to the Crimea term, of course. And I have uh, one question. If you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of Crimeans who live in Crimea now, they support Ukraine and uh, it's firstly pro-Ukraine activists and Crimean Tatar uh, nation in Crimea. But uh, now we have really strong uh, repressions uh, for this group. And uh, my question is how Europe can support these activists and Crimean Tatar uh, activists and pro-Ukraine activists that have a brave to live in Crimea now. Schönen Dank. Wir sammeln ein bisschen. Bitte schön. Wonderful. Next question. My name is Grosse. I am chairperson of the Liberals in the district of Dahlem here in Berlin, and I have a twofold question. First, I'd like to know more about the business model of the Ukraine. I mean, I think when I invest money somewhere, then actually at the end of the day, I want to get something back. And I'm interested in the industrial branches uh, that will be supported with this money in Ukraine. And then to come back what you said, this cold, this frostiness that we have here in Germany. See, I mean, I cannot really subscribe to this. My wife comes from Ukraine and we have phone calls with people in Kiev almost every day. And uh, we get feedback and in fact, positive feedback. And from my point of view, also the media coverage is a catastrophe because primarily they focus on the war and they do not really focus on the people and their stories. See, last year there was a wonderful event in the Ukrainian embassy and NGOs that was fantastic. Wolfgang Templin, publicist, up until 2013, I was responsible for the office of the Böll Foundation in Warsaw. I have a question to Mr. Liftzuk uh, that builds on the question of the facilitator, especially the second one. You, as a deputy, you now face a multiple challenge, especially in this very difficult times. So the parliamentary practice towards the government, and then also the presidential administration. In these new conditions, and based on the results of the elections, surprising decisions were taken, i.e., ministers are taken on board into the government. They got the Ukrainian passport. They sometimes also had a diaspora background. However, they don't come from Ukraine, but they have a completely different background. 
I hear from Ukrainian channels and in discussions that this is a highly disputed decision. Some say, thanks God, this is what we need. We need fresh blood, so to say. And they have so much experience, I think it's about three ministers, that this is a good decision. Others say, no, they don't have the necessary decision. They will definitely go back to the old cronies and have wrong consultants. I mean, what do you think of this decision. Is this a chance, a good opportunity in the context of all the other arguments that were brought forward, i.e. that you need more expertise and where can we get it from? And has this proved to be a positive or a negative decision? Thank you. Hoon University Kassel. A quick question. Ukrainian parliamentarians How can they maintain their independence when they only get 150 euros or the equivalent in your currency? Well, but I think we have to say that this was always the official numbers and nevertheless we have a great amount of wealth among parliamentarians which is in fact one of the key secrets of this time of political order. So let's maybe let's maybe go back to the first question for Svetlana. What can Europe do to support the Krim Tatars? To be honest, I thought it's a question rather to Europeans and to Marie Louise. What Europe can do for uh, Crimean Tatar, really? Well, I guess now I I needed to say when I talk about the institutions, the Council of Europe, the European Union, I mean, the Council of Europe is a a more or less fragile organization. And I'm very cautious in my wording. I think right now it's really about creating publicity so that people don't forget that people have been hijacked hijacked actually from Crimea, people who are now in Russian courts because of high treason and who face prison times up to eight, ten years. Now think of this one director who was a single dad, it sends off exactly, and many others. See, we have to make sure that we keep awake these faces in our public. And uh, we also have to talk about the Krim Tatars, by the way, and say that they have a history of deportations under Stalin. And once channels open up again, we also have to support these plants, small plants of a civil society and let them grow, cultivate them. And this is what I think we can currently do. Svetlana, now it was about the business model, the second question. Then it was about the ministers uh, that come from abroad and how parliamentarians can assume their roles with the salary you get paid. Well, uh, let's start with the new ministers. Uh, in fact, I would like to inform you that all the ministers that have been invited, not Ukrainian ministers that were invited to the government, they are all very experienced and that's why they were invited. Uh, for, for example, the minister for, the, for health, he used to be the minister of health in Georgia and he managed to break this corruption system uh, and that's why he was invited in Ukraine. Secondly, the minister for finance, uh, she's uh, um, actually an American but she lived for 20 years already in Ukraine and she was very successful business lady that's why she was invited to the government moreover the minister for economy for example he's Lithuanian once again for 20 last years he was living in Ukraine that's why he knows the system he knows the institution and even now I have to admit that he's one of those few ministries who managed to launch a very dramatic reforms for example he uh, um, de- uh, decreased by 30 percent already his staff in the ministry which is one of the part of this public administration reform that we are talking about so The example is quite successful and I, uh, we can 
discuss it whether it's a good idea or not, but I mean, we have to judge by results. And so far, the results are there. With regards to independence of, the, uh, of MPs, well, you are absolutely right. I mean, it's uh, for me and ma many of my colleagues who were at Euromaidan and who were uh, in previous Orange Revolution for journalists, for people from civil society, who decided to go to the parliament. As for the moment, I consider it as a sacrifice. Because in Germany, probably it will be difficult to find a person who would voluntarily agree to give up with a, a job that where he earned, she earned 10, time, 10 times more and go to the public administration where you would be criticized for anything you are doing. Because we are living in the times where, where we are criticized for everything. Because the level of unsatisfaction and the challenges we face, it's impossible to be satisfied. But we are this mission driven, we are this dignity driven and we made this choice because we believe that we can do something from inside that potentially may bring another generation of youngsters into the parliament and they finally, well, the economy will be in a, in a mode, in a stage when it will work and they will be able to get bigger salary, so it's going to be sustainable. So it's up to us to create this sustainable system so that allow the next generation of politicians to get this normal money. Now I'm completely dependent on my fiancé, I have to admit. And, uh, and uh, thank you. And the last, uh, uh, the last qu question on business model. <laughs> the business model at the moment is to survive, I have to believe, <laughs> I have to say. And uh, that's going to be true. I mean, uh, indeed, Marie Louise mentioned that European Union uh, opened its economy uh, um, it's one way in direction to, to Ukrainian business. I mean, within the framework of um, DCFTA, uh, our free trade agreement, part of European Association. Uh, and uh, business now are trying to be reoriented, losing, having lost. Russian market, having lost Crimea, as you've correctly, correctly mentioned. We're trying to learn new rules, new customs, new systems, and many of the legislation that already have been uh, voted on uh, metrology, on stand standards, others, are uh, basically, it's a new system for our economy, for our business to learn it and to try to conquer European, European market. Thank you. Noch zwei Fragen. We have time for two more questions. First, the gentleman in the front. And we need once again the microphone. Good evening. My name is Karimi Nesali. I am from Iraq. But tonight, it is an event with a European dimension, but also with an international dimension. I have a question, and I think Maria Beck or Svetlana can answer my question. And then I have a comment. Do we return to the history of peoples? Do we accept that the Russian and the Ukrainian peoples in different ways share commonalities, language, culture, music, tradition, And they have a lot of relatives. And my question is, therefore, why do these people from these two nations, who have a long history, why don't they take their fates into their own hand? Why don't they try to solve the problem? And I say quite clearly, free from the West, the Western role. And in fact, I love democracy, European literature and culture. However, 
it has proven, especially in the Middle East, that a European foreign policy triggers hatred between people, peoples, and tribes. Thank you. We have got your question. No, 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 no. I have not finished my question. But I said explicitly, please keep it short. Ms. Vitlana, you said that there were people on Maidan to die because of European values. And I think you refer to human rights and democracy. These European values, what is left? What is left since there is no democracy at all? And where there are so many other problems. Thank you so much for this question. So the time is now over, I guess, after this last week. Nikolai Kromik, I'm a free journalist, and I have two questions for Svetlana Salivchuk. First of all, I myself, I come from Crimea, and on behalf of Crimea, I would like to tell you that the population there actually feels ignored and abandoned by politicians in Kiev. They have the impression that politicians don't pay attention to them. They lack a vision, the people on Crimea. Can you tell me what the political circles discuss when it comes to Crimea? And then a second question. In fact, you haven't answered the question of my colleague, how you pay for your expenses. I, I told actually, I told it. Politically, I'm independent, but financially, I completely depended on my fiance. So um, that's first. Secondly, with regards to, I would answer first Karib question. He asked about the values. I'll tell you, well, you asked whether we have to take our destiny in our hands, but this is exactly what we did during Euromaidan, you know? And, um, uh, you know, myself, I, am, I have Russian blood. My grandmother is from Smolensk. Russian language is a native language for me. I speak both Ukrainian and Russian. My mother used to be a teacher of Russian language, but at the same time, I identify myself as Ukraine, and I made this choice, which is just democracy, which is a European development. And I'll tell you very easily, while you are arrested, for example, believe me, you'd prefer to be not in the Russian or Ukrainian prison, but in the European prison. And this, this is a simply, simply answer of why we chose European democracy. Uh, just to add up between the Russians and Ukrainians, I would say. We all know that there are many links and in fact all the research from Ukrainian side on before the war indicated that Ukrainians want to have good relations with Russia. That's, that's for sure, but I wanted to mention just one thing. If you look at the trajectory, how Ukraine developed after the uh, disintegration of Soviet Union after, and how Russia developed, you will see completely two different stories. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. It, it had 25 years of difficult political developments, but remarkably without domestic violence, without resorting to domestic violence. There was a peaceful revolution, Orange Revolution in 2004, and then repeated in 2014. It didn't have a history of ethnic violence. This was created by the Russians. And it's a completely different story than how Russia developed with internal wars, uh, ethnic conflict, uh, which was part of the as a method of governance. So 
Yes, Russia and Ukraine have similarities in their cultures, but in terms of their political cultures, what happened during the last 25 years is a completely different trajectory, and I think we shouldn't uh, forget about it when we talk about Russia and Ukraine today and where they are. Ich wünsche mir In fact, now that we spend more and more time with Ukraine and that we see more and more faces, such as Svetlana, I actually wish that we understand that they are Europeans and that they are not far away from us. That beyond politics, we can also do things, i.e. see these faces. During our last trip, Ralf and I, we traveled to Eastern Ukraine two weeks ago. And last, we went to Bilovox, a small village with 24,000 inhabitants and 20,000 refugees. I mean, think about the challenge they have to master there. And we went to a hospital there, even though I shouldn't really call it hospital. I mean, it was a small institution where the doctors get 70 euros, but they all stayed there and kept their jobs. Also, there were two doctors from Kiev, working on a voluntary basis, sleeping in the x-ray room because the x-ray machine doesn't work at all. Birth rates triple because women from Luhansk and Donetsk now make an effort to give birth to their children in this little hospital. And we were expecting our next grandchild. And I had a look at this gynecological corner, and I really got goosebumps because I don't wish any single woman to be forced to give birth to a child in such a setting. When we returned two hours later, as it should be, in a perfect condition, our next grandchild was born. And see, I hope that all of you will take this note back home with you, that you turn to your computer back home and that you type in better org and that you donate a euro, two euros, 50, three or five, simply by clicking a mouse because we want to set up a gynecological section in this hospital to make it easier for women to give birth to their children there. Actually, this is an American idea how you can achieve a great thing with small amounts of money. It won't change the world. It cannot stop Putin. But it will show the people who work there that we have people here who have not forgotten them. And this is, in fact, my wish tonight. Take home with you this card. Evgeny, would you also like to be a midwife, so to say, for something? <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm also in gynecological departments, and uh, as Marie Louise said, uh, it's not much better in Russia. But the situation in Russia, when it comes to the whole development, well, then we need to say that we're at the state of an embryo. And we don't know yet, will we have a boy who once will hold a machine gun, or will we have a very peaceful girl, friendly to everyone around? But you know what? We make an effort an effort that at the end of the day, we have robust peace. When in November 2013, when in November 2013, Maidan started, for a lot of people in the European Union, this was an irritation, if not even an unreasonable demand that actually the Ukrainians reminded the Europeans what this Europe was actually developed for. It is about a life style. It's about a way of life where it's about the inalienable right of women. 
and that we have our dignity. And it seems that some of us have forgotten that the achievement such as division of power or the could avoid the accumulation of uncontrolled power. And therefore, Europe has now learned its lesson in the past year and a half. Once it's understood that it's not about a new confrontation with Russia and the West, but that it was rather about the question whether we still believe in human rights and the rule of law, and that there are a lot of Russians who believe in this also. Or do we slander this because this is good for authoritarian achievements? And these year and a half, we have understood that these authoritarian achievements are really robust and strong. In this past year and a half, we have one seen this phenomenon that people from the right and the left join forces across political lines. And we have people such as Orban who says he is proud. He doesn't want to have liberal values such as division of power, democracy, and human rights. And then we have Syriza to the very left and the weird Putin coalition where we need to see that the new coalition formation has nothing to do with one's existing political camps, but rather about how can we slander and talk down the achievements of democracy and rule of law, or do I support these values? And in this respect, Maidan is a test case for Europe. And I believe that this test case, if, if we see that Russian money goes to Marie Le Pen, as Timothy Snyder said early on this afternoon, will not be over as of tomorrow. No, this test case of Europe will last not only in Germany, but in all of Europe. And we need to master it successfully. And I think there is one thing that the Ukrainians reminded us of. There are very simple truisms. And with these truisms, we who live in postmodernity and who grew up with relativistic traditions, and when it comes to the deconstruction of thinking, we encounter problems. But there are truisms. 2014 it was presidential candidates should not be poisoned. And now the simple truth is territorial integrity of Ukraine was violated with the annexation of Crimea and therefore the foundation of European peace work since it was stipulated in the Carter of Helsinki was undermined. And there is a war, a war where we have an aggressor and a victim. Equity stance, something that we hear very often in Germany, is nothing but the attempt to steal away from the own guilt. There are perpetrators and there are victors, victims. And I think this is the reason for such conferences that they strengthen the analytical strength. And therefore, I'd like to thank the Böll Foundation and all of you who came here today.